So about tonight's presentation, One Book Chelmsford is an annual town-wide event that has been put together by the library and the Friends of the Library every year for the past 15 years. For 2021, we decided that we needed to choose a book that would bring people comfort and inspiration and perhaps a path through grief and pain. How to Be a Good Creature, as well as the gorgeous children's version, Becoming a Good Creature by Cy Montgomery, seemed the perfect encapsulation of those intentions. Ms. Montgomery is the author of 28 books for adults and children and has received many honors for her writing. She also writes for magazines, newspapers, and broadcast television in America and overseas in an effort to reach as wide an audience as possible at what she considers a critical turning point in human history. To research books, films, and articles, Cy Montgomery has been chased by angry silverback, an angry silverback gorilla in Zaire, and bitten by a vampire bat in Costa Rica, worked in a pit crawling with 18,000 snakes in Manitoba, handled a wild tarantula in French Guiana, and many other amazing adventures to connect with our fellow creatures. I would like to thank the Friends of the Chelmsford Library that continue to make these programs possible, and Ms. Montgomery's publisher, Harton Mifflin Harcourt, for bringing her to us. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to Cy Montgomery to share some of her stories with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you so much for that great introduction. And it's terrific to be together tonight on this, this wonderful spring evening that I'm hoping may bring a salamander migration at the end of it. Anyway, I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world. Um, one, to be among friends tonight, but two, because of what I get to do for a living like this. I get to make friends with cheetahs in Namibia. This, this one lives at the Cheetah Conservation Fund where I worked with Dr. Lori Marker on a book called Chasing Cheetahs. This is um, an ambassador cheetah who was raised in captivity. I don't recommend that you try to do this with a cheetah that you haven't met yet, but cheetahs actually can be very friendly. And there's some video as we were talking about earlier while I was in the green room, um, sometimes rarely, but sometimes on safari, Cheetahs have been known to jump into the safari vehicle just to visit with the people. Well, I've made a lot of neat friends. Here's another one. This is a pink river dolphin that lives in the Amazon. When I first told my mother I was doing a book on pink river dolphins, she thought it might be one of those things that appears after your second or possibly third martini, but they're actually real. They're believed to be enchanted. And I've actually made seven trips to the Amazon for various stories, and it truly is an enchanting place. Um, also in another part of Brazil, in the Pantanal, I met this lovely creature who I adore because it's someone who has an even more dramatic nose than I do. This is a tapir, a baby tapir, who looks kind of like a little watermelon. But look at this adult. And guess what her name is? She's actually named Cy Montgomery. And Cy Montgomery has never looked more glamorous in swimwear. There she's, you can see she's wearing a radio collar that uh, works even when in the water. And she's a, a lovely, sleek mama tapir who's still living in the Pantanal of Brazil. And I get to make friends with octopuses. Some of you may know my book, The Soul of an Octopus, which was researched largely in Boston, but um, also I learned to scuba dive uh, in order to, to get up close and personal with these animals. And all of these experiences, as you can well imagine, are absolutely transformative and magical. And so how did this life come about? Sometimes I keep wondering when I'm going to wake up. Is this really a dream? But um, the, the way it happened, I think, is because I've always believed in this saying that's served as a promise to me. And it's actually a saying that some people have heard in AA. Some people have heard it presented as a Buddhist koan. But it goes like this. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, sometimes you have to go to the teacher. 
my work has taken me to Mongolia, where I was looking for these snow leopards. It's taken me to meet tigers in the largest mangrove swamp in the world, Shundervan, where the tigers swim out after your boat and get on board and eat you. Well, I can thank my teachers for this. And this is a picture I wanted so much to share with you. This was my journalism teacher in my second high school, Walter Clarkson. He was so important in my life. But I'm gonna share with you tonight some of the important teachers I didn't meet in a classroom at all. And few of them look like the handsome Mr. Clarkson. Some have had two legs like him, some have had four, some have had six, and some like this lovely tarantula have had eight. And then sometimes there's those that have none like this lovely anaconda. Now humans, have recognized for millennia that animals can be teachers, but it's something that in the West we sometimes forget. But people who live close to the earth remember. The bear, for example, Native Americans of many different nations have held for hundreds of years that the bear was the first medicine man or medicine woman they believe that bears taught humans the use of medicinal herbs. And as you know, so many of the medicines that we now rely on in the West and get at the drugstore were originally found as compounds in plants. Now, the idea of the bear as medicine woman, it sounds like a just so story, you know, one of those funny little myths that we like to dismiss or make into children's stories. But in reality, bears do use medicines. In fact, a number of animals do. And they have sophisticated ways of sensing the chemical properties of plants. And just one example is something that bears have been known to do and humans have seen them do it. They will methodically strip the bark off a willow tree and chew it up Sometimes they will use the chewed up willow tree bark as like a poultice around a tooth. And you know why they do that? Is because willow bark is a source of salicylic acid, which is the active ingredient in aspirin, which Native Americans use to this day to make a willow bark tea to take away pain and inflammation. So that is true. Animals, you see, have powers that, I'm gonna quote Henry Beston in one of my favorite books, The Outermost House. They have powers that we have lost or never attained. They're living by voices, he wrote, that we shall never hear. And in fact, he was prescient when he wrote these words because he could not have known back then what was discovered in the 1980s, and that was that elephants, for example, can hear infrasound that we cannot, lower than we can hear, and that they can communicate over vast distances using infrasound. This was discovered by one of the co-discoverers, actually was one of my best friends, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas. But Katie Payne, whose husband Roger Payne discovered the songs of humpback whales, discovered infrasound in elephants. Other animals, sharks, like this handsome great white shark, they can detect scents at such low levels, one part per 25 million, one squirt of tuna oil in a swimming pool. They can also, using other organs, detect the electrical signals of the beating hearts of their prey. Well, how to be a good creature is my homage to animals who've let me be a part of their world and has, have sculpted my life by sharing with me some of their secrets. I was once asked by my good friend, the author Vicki Croak, you might know her latest book was Elephant Company, a wonderful book. Um, she, she asked me on a, a show that, that she had 
not just what I'd learned about animals themselves in my work, but whether I'd also learned lessons about life for myself. And what the animals have taught me, I answered was how to be a good creature. And it turned into this book. So I know that some of you have read the book. Some of you may be in the process of reading it. Uh, some of you may be fixing to read it, but I thought I would, I would share with you some of the stories and backstories from that book. I want to introduce you first to my first teacher, Molly. And oh my gosh, she was the answer to my prayers. When I was a little girl, as soon as I learned to speak, I was able to communicate to my parents that I had a terrible existential problem. And this was that I was not really a little girl, but I was a horse. My mother was very disturbed. She went to the pediatrician. The pediatrician said, don't worry, it's just a phase, she'll be over with it. Which I was when I discovered that no, I really was a dog. And I wanted desperately to be a dog. But at that time, Everyone was so eager to teach me to be a little girl, and I had no interest in this. I needed a dog to teach me how to be what I wanted to be. I was one of those kids who loved all animals from the start. And Molly, when she came into our lives when I was three, became my very first teacher. Remember, you know, my life's ambition is to be a dog. I dreamed of running away with Molly and living in a hollow tree in the woods. And Molly would teach me the secrets of all the other animals because even as a small child, I could see that she had senses that I did not. She could smell stuff that I couldn't perceive. She could see in the dark because dogs and cats and quite a few other animals have a tapetum lucidum in the back of the eye and they can see in the dark. They can hear frequencies we cannot hear. They are experiencing a world that we live in, but that we can't touch. And I desperately wanted to know that wider world. Well, I grew up to do what I always wanted to do with Molly. I didn't run away and live in the woods in a hollow tree, but I did become a writer and naturalist. And look at my life. I get to travel all over the world and learn the secrets of animals. But how was I gonna do that? How did I find the first step off the beaten path? Well, it was Molly who showed me the way. And even though she died when I was a teenager, soon when the student was ready, the teacher would appear. And the next teacher I want to introduce you to actually is the Southern hairy-nosed wombat. When I went to college, I studied uh, magazine journalism and French and psychology, and I knew I wanted to work on a newspaper. I knew I wanted to write about animals. I wrote for five years. Um, I had a column. I covered environment and science and medicine, and I loved it. And after five years, I finally had a chance to take a vacation. And my father bought me a ticket to Australia. This was um, a wonderful opportunity, but I didn't just want a vacation there. I wanted to learn about the unique animals and possibly give back. And I found this organization called Earthwatch that pairs paying laymen with scientific projects around the world. And there was a scientific project going on then that you could join for two weeks called Drought Refugia, examining the life of the Southern hairy nosed wombat living in warrens in the driest state in the driest continent on earth. And I loved it so much. I desperately wanted to come back. But Dr. Pamela Parker, who ran the project, she couldn't hire me. She wasn't budgeted to hire me and she couldn't even give me a ticket to come back. But she saw I was in love with this and she saw I was a hard worker. And she told me, you know what? If you want to come back and study anything you want, I can't pay you. I can't get your ticket back, 
but you can stay at my camp and I will give you food. So I quit my job and moved to a tent in the outback. And one day looked up to see three of these birds just walking by. They were emus as tall as a man, flightless birds who can run 40 miles an hour over the outback. I was enchanted. I spent six months getting to know them, following them around. And I didn't discover anything, you know, like Jane Goodall did with chimpanzees using tools. I just found out what they did all day. And no one had done that before. What I found out that was truly life altering, altered only my own life. But it showed me this I can do. For the rest of my life, I'm going to apprentice myself to animal after animal and trust those teachers to lead the way. And they showed me my destiny. Well, I wanna introduce you to yet another teacher. I like to tell people when I visit schools, I say, you know what? One of my teachers was actually a uh, big fat pig. Christopher Hogwood was so little when I met him, he came home in my lap in a shoebox, but he soon grew to a 750 pound great big Buddha master. And this pig, this great guy taught me so many things. He taught me how much fun children were to play with. I'd never really had friends who were children when I was growing up. Lots of plastic dinosaurs, lots of friends who were animals. Um, a few friends who were adults, but I'd never really made friends with children because they were too wiggly and too loud. And for various reasons, I wasn't really around children much. But I learned they can be a real blast. But you know what Christopher Hogwood really taught me? He was kind of the anchor that taught me what family really was. He came into my life at a time when my parents actually disowned me. They disowned me for marrying someone of whom they did not approve. My very favorite author on this planet, Howard Mansfield, check out his books. They are awesome. He's the best writer I've ever known. And he actually hired me onto the college daily back in the 70s. And I love him more than anything in the world. But my parents didn't want me to marry him because he was Jewish. Later, I found out my father was Jewish, which my mother didn't know. But you know what? My parents would not accept the person I loved and didn't think, you know, they thought he was like other. Well, Christopher Hogwood didn't mind that I was a human. He was willing to overlook that I lacked a curly tail and a flexible nose disc. He was happy to be part of the family anyway. And he's the one who showed me that families are made not of blood, but they're made out of love. And here's another creature right here who taught me a hard lesson. Sometimes the lessons we learn are not always heartwarming and encouraging. I met this weasel on a Christmas morning after I discovered one of my beloved chickens had been killed by this weasel. This is an ermine. This is the white-coated version of the least weasel. But this animal, in doing that act and in showing herself to me in her pure white raiment, what she taught me was forgiveness and how wonderful that feels. Tree kangaroos in Papua New Guinea. Another thing that sounds like, you know, they appear after the third or fourth martini. They're real. There's actually 10 species of tree kangaroos on the planet. But tree kangaroos taught me another important life lesson because they are the ones that made me fall back in love again with life when I had despaired and thought everything was lost was after my dog, my first, our first border collie Tess had died. Our pig, Christopher Hogwood had died, all, both of old age. 
the little girls who I'd fallen in love with next door and who were like our own kids had moved away. It seemed like everything was over. But then I took this trip to Papua New Guinea for another book, which was like one last thing that I felt willing to do before just giving everything up and fell back in love with life again because of these gorgeous, unlikely creatures and octopuses. Octopuses, what they taught me, I think, with their alien being was that someone as different from you as an outer space alien can be your friend. Octopuses are so unlike humans that you really would have to go to outer space or science fiction to find something more different. They have no bones. Their bodies are arranged totally differently than ours. Their brains are a ring around their neck. They can change color and shape. They can pour their boneless bodies through a tiny opening. They taste with all of their skin. And yet, I have had some very good friends who are octopuses who would turn bright red with joy when they would see me and who would reach toward me to essentially hug me the way you would hug your friend that you haven't seen in a long time. And by the way, they also hug and kiss you because all of those suckers are capable of giving you a lovely kiss, not just a kiss, but a hickey actually. Look at the su suction power of these suckers. Um, a big sucker, a three and a half inch sucker, single one can lift 30 pounds, okay? Um, and there's 200 suckers on each of the eight arms. Octopuses, by the way, have a beak like a parrot and venom like a snake, as well as ink as like an old fashioned pen. And yet, one of my very good friends was an octopus named Octavia. And here she is in a peaceful pose, and you can see in the corner what looks like almost strings of pearls or, or little rice grains. Those are hundreds and thousands of eggs that she's laid. And I want to tell you what happened at the end of her life. Octopuses only live three to five years. And by the time you meet the octopus, they're already usually a year old or two years old. Well, I met Octavia the day she came into New England Aquarium or a couple days afterwards. We became very good friends. We loved to play things together. Um, she would show me that she enjoyed my company by turning red, by coming over to me. Um, we would play games together. We played with toys. She let me pet her. She would turn white beneath my touch, the color of a relaxed octopus. But everything changed one day when she laid eggs. And octopuses do this at the end of their lives. Her eggs were not fertile. But just like a wild octopus would on her fertile eggs, she guarded those eggs and did not leave her lair, not to play with me or anyone else, not to go hunting. We actually would hand her food on the end of a long stick, but in the wild, a wild octopus who's sitting on her eggs, she won't eat, she won't hunt. She just is thinking about her eggs and she will stay on those eggs for six months. Well, six months came and went. And of course her infertile eggs did not hatch. Seven months, eight months, nine months, Many, many months went by. And when you consider they only live three to five years, this is the equivalent of decades. And because she was staying in her lair and we weren't playing or seeing each other, I didn't even know if she remembered who I was. Well, one day toward the end of her life, it was evident that she developed an infection. And the aquarium staff, Bill Murphy, in fact, decided that she should be removed from exhibit and be able to be in a perfectly still, dark, quiet place like a wild octopus would and spend the remainder of her short life in, in quietude. And I came in to see her after she had been moved. 
I didn't expect her to recognize me, but I wanted to say goodbye. Well, I was astonished when I opened the top and she floated up to the top to greet me. And she was excited to see me. It was a lot of effort for her to come up. She was old, she was sick, she was actually very close to death. And she made an effort to come see me. And I offered her a fish, but she didn't want it. She took it and just dropped it. She came to the top. She touched me with her suckers. She held on to me. She looked into my face and we held each other for a long while until she exhausted, sank back to the bottom and died not long after that. It was a pretty amazing experience to share that with an octopus. And what it showed me was the truth of another saying, I'm quoting a lot of people smarter than me tonight. It's one that's attributed to Thales and Miletus, the Greek philosopher. And it goes like this, the universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. And to me, what that says is that the universe is so much more full of life and love, so incandescent with life, we almost can't imagine its glory. And we are so privileged to be here on this gorgeous, gorgeous world, a world full of thinking, feeling souls who remind us how lucky we are to share the sweet green earth, a world that's far more vibrant and holy than anything we can imagine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sai. That was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Loved all of the images and the stories that you have to share about these animals that mean so much to you. It's really remarkable. Um, but I had a question about how you chose the animals for this book. Did you? I mean, you've had you, you've you've encountered and connected with so many creatures over the course of your career and continue to. Um, but how did you choose these thirteen? That's a great question um, because there are so many other animals and in Becoming a Good Creature, the book I wrote for children, there's more species. Um, but for the adult book, I wanted to choose animals who had helped me at critical junctures of my life that I knew that um, readers too would have uh, met those same challenges. So I looked at things like, you know, finding your passion, um, finding the path to your passion, um, building a family, uh, learning to overcome challenges, uh, learning to forgive. Um, and the, the, uh, the last chapter, which is the last chapter in both books, uh, is on our border collie Thurber, who's with me right now, but he's in the Thunder support group under the table here. Uh, he's, uh, what he showed me is, and boy, I, I had no idea this would come out during a pandemic, but what he showed me is that when you least expect it, there is something incredibly wonderful waiting for you around the corner. What, what had happened, I had, I had come back from the book tour for uh, The Soul of an Octopus and the book had become a national bestseller and I should have been feeling great, but I came home to find that our, our border collie, our second border collie, Sally, was near, near death from a brain tumor. And she died in my arms. Um, our vet came to our, our bedroom to give her the shot that ended her life. And I thought, oh, man, I'm just gonna spiral into a horrible depression as, as I had when I lost um, Christopher Hogwood and Tess. 
And then I got a call from our vet a few weeks later. This is Chuck DeVinney. God bless Chuck DeVinney, who's still our vet. And uh, he told me there were a whole bunch of puppies from this big border collie puppy breeder, um, Dave Kennard, who, who I know. And all of his dogs are professional herders. And I knew he would never sell anybody a, a, a pet dog because they all go on to professionally herd. And I said, oh, I bet they're really cute. And he goes, yeah, they're all really healthy. But there's one who's got a blind eye. Would you take him? And the student wasn't ready, but the teacher appeared anyway. <laughs> he is just the love, the love of, of our life. And he's such a happy guy, man. He's so happy. He sings. Um, we sing in the car together. Howling is, as you can imagine, it's a choral activity. And sometimes he, he loves to howl to classical music. There's this one, um, my, my a friend of mine in, in Canada, Andrew Hackett, sent me the CD of, of Christian rock music. And there's this one song, actually Thurbert likes that album very much. And he just howls to that thing. It's, it's just, <laughs> he has so much fun. And now he even howls when I start to, to sing. And um, <laughs> the, the whole side, the whole passenger side of the windshield is covered with his nose prints from when his head shoots up and, <laughs> and hits the windshield. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, how do you come across your projects? Do you think about the animal you want to study first, or do you think about the connections you have to the scientific community and the projects that they're working on? Um, where do your projects come from? Well, it, it varies. Um, sometimes you're, you're, well, for my first book, my first book was um, Walking with the Great Apes. And it's an homage to three women who inspired me greatly when I was growing up, Jane Goodall. Diane Fossey, who studied mountain gorillas in Veruta Galdicas, who studied orangutans in Borneo. And I felt that my first book should be an act of homage to these women. So that was the moral reason I wanted to do that. Um, other times, the next, the next book was um, Spell of the Tiger. And I felt like I wanted to, to look at relationships between people and animals because actually the first book it's not a biography of those three women. It's a biography of their relationships with their study animals, which is quite different. So what I really write about is relationships that we have with animals. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to look at our relationship with predators and what was like the, the biggest, scariest, deadliest in, in some ways predator. And it was these tigers, these man-eating tigers that live in Shunderman and kill hundreds of people a year. And I thought, ah, that's where I want to go. Of course, Howard was thrilled, you know, but I told him, well, don't worry, honey, they're man-eaters. The women stay home where they're eaten by crocodiles. <laughs> so, you know, it, it kind of depends on, and sometimes when you're in the field, I was researching uh, Journey of the Pink Dolphins and I met this uh, wonderful, um, in, um, this wonderful biologist, an evolutionary biologist named Gary Galbraith. And he told me about these, these strange bears he thought might be another species that he'd come across in Southern China. And then that turned into search for the golden moon bear. And um, I was talking about pink dolphins at a, a zoo. And that's how I met Lisa Daybeck who, um, studied the the tree kangaroos and you know the teacher is constantly appearing so mm -hmm. that's now the octopus the octopus book that was a book that I had in mind sort of for a very long time but I wasn't ready to write it until I started the research in 2011 I'd always wanted to write about invertebrates but I wasn't smart enough and there wasn't enough like there wasn't a, enough research material to support what I tend to believe about all animals, that they are way smarter than we actually believe. Mm -hmm. Have you ever studied or worked with pandas before? I have not. Um, I'd love to, but uh, I, I, I haven't. Um, I, you, you have to go to China for that. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that might be a project for, 
few years from now. <laughs> right, right. So what is next on your list? Um, uh, what's the next, um, what's, what, what kinds of projects you have on the horizon right now? Well, I've got a new book coming out actually like week after next. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's uh, let's see if I have the, no, I don't have the, I don't have a copy yet. Um, it's, it's called uh, the, the, the Hummingbird's Gift. And it's, it's a pretty small book. And I imagine it would be a good Mother's Day kind of gift because the story of, um, I was lucky enough to as- assist my wonderful friend and all around angel, uh, Brenda Sherburn LaBelle in rescuing, raising, and eventually releasing to the wild two tiny orphaned baby hummingbirds. And these animals hatched out of of eggs the size of navy beans. They were born the size of bumblebees. You can't imagine anything more vulnerable, more delicate. And and yet they they eventually own the sky like no other bird does. Mm -hmm. So um, having a hand in that resurrection was just a fabulous experience for me. And... um, one I'm delighted to share with people at a time that, again, you know, how could I know that we'd all be coming out of this pandemic? Um, yeah. But it's a good thing to remind us that resurrection is possible. Then Erin um, asks, I love wild animals and I'm fascinated by them, but I'm increasingly bothered by the wild animals in captivity unless they have been there for survival reasons. I noticed in the octopus chapter, it seemed that aquarium just wanted to find an octopus to have one to see. Does that, do you share that concern? Why or why not? Well, the thing with wild octopuses, as I saw with Octavia, I mean, first of all, I want to I want to say thank you so much for asking that question because you know we do live in a world in which we treat animals as if they are resources, and I don't consider them resources. I consider them individuals who love their lives like we love ours. Um, and they have just as, as much a right to enjoy their precious wild lives as we do. Um, but unfortunately there are so many of us and we louse at the world so badly that for many animals right now, um, the only way to survive is in a zoo or an aquarium. Now, the problem for every wild octopus who has ever existed, however, is that they lay 100,000 eggs. Okay, this is for uh, giant Pacific octopus. Um, Out of those 100,000 eggs, two of them are gonna survive, two. Every other one is going to be eaten alive, frequently torn to bits. Now, some, as larvae, uh, paralarvae, as tiny babies, will just get sucked into the maw of some creature, mm-hmm. but um, which is not all that great a fate. So, you know, the, the octopus that wins the lottery gets to live long enough that it's not eaten alive and torn to bits. But everyone else is going to have a miserable life unless an aquarium gets you. In which case, if you are at a good aquarium where you know you have an interesting place to live and stuff to do, um, you have really lucked out because you're not going to have to regrow your arms because they've been bitten off by a moray eel or by a, a shark. You're not going to have to spend 70 to 90 percent of your life hiding in a hole, which is what wild octopuses do. So the octopuses who, who I knew, I know that they were doing better than almost every other wild octopus in the world. One reason that it's so hard to study octopuses in the wild, and one reason that that wonderful film, My Octopus Teacher, was so remarkable, is that you try to study the octopus, and the second day you go back to where it was, and someone's eaten it. And not just a person. I mean, lots of animals eat them but there's a legal fishery for octopuses, as you know, and it's not just a fishery to eat the octopus. There's a fishery for octopus for bait. 
And what people do is they take the octopus and they cut the animal's arms off and the arms can like go off and do stuff once they're severed from the body. So it makes terrific bait because the arm is like wiggling around and stuff. So um, when you look at, when you look at that, when you look at the way, you know, what a wild octopus normally faces, I, w- I would, you know, of course I'd rather want to be the octopus that manages to survive on my own in the wild. Maybe, although maybe I might want to live in captivity. I'm living in captivity. You know, I'm not, I'm not living in a cave somewhere. <laughs> I'm getting regular veterinary slash medical care. Um, and uh, I know those animals are having a good life. And, and I think that it's important to right now in human history to have these kind of ambassadors to save our seas. The seas are under assault right now. By 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. The sea is warming faster than the land. I mean, it's a disaster. And the way you get people to care about the sea is through giving them a chance to meet these these creatures. So that's my long explanation um, for for why um, I think that aquariums and zoos have an important role to play right now. There's a number of, of animals that would not be alive on this earth if it were not for zoos. And one of them is the California condor. And I did a whole book about that. They were extinct in the wild. And now there's hundreds flying free. And mm. that is because of zoos. The, um, on the other side of that, though, we have uh, last year, lots of us watched Tiger King and were shocked by the world of exotic animal trading and display in the U.S. And what can be done to create greater oversight so that creatures in captivity live in acceptable conditions and are not exploited? Yeah, God, I never saw that series, but I, of course I knew about it. We, we, have, to, we have to stand up for those animals. And we, when we see something wrong, oh gosh, what's the name of this book? Oh man, I'm sorry. Um, a, a preteen boy managed to get, um, oh, I wrote a whole book about this and I'm just blanking on it. Um, and managed to get a, a, a roadside zoo completely shut down almost entirely by himself, showing that we all have an enormous power. What he did was he wrote letters and he, he let his fellow citizens know about it and people will, people will rise up and they will change things for animals uh, who, are, who, are being, who are being abused. And if, if you look at the change that I've just seen just in my lifetime, and I'm 63, um, Jane Goodall went into the field in 1960. At that time, researchers didn't even, they weren't supposed to even name their study animals in the wild because it was thought they were all the same. Mm -hmm. And now there's a thing called the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, which is profoundly affecting the way that that animals, for example, in laboratories, even, even invertebrates like octopus are being treated. So we're, we're not there yet. We haven't finished this at all, but just in my lifetime, I've seen such terrific progress. And that's why I think that we're living in a great time in human history. We have one um, audience member who's nine years old and loves to write. I think I would like to be a nature journalist when I grow up. I'm reading all of your books I can find. What recommendations do you have for me to learn more about being a journalist like you? Wow. Well, one, I want to assure you that you can totally do this because you're as smart or smarter than I am. Um, In fact, if your school has a newspaper or a yearbook, I would say start writing for that newspaper or yearbook. And when you get into high school, you will almost certainly have a, a, a newspaper, a yearbook, a literary magazine. So write as much as you can and get it published and get it edited. Now, a lot of people these days will say, oh, you know, you must start a blog. Well, that's perfectly fine, but no one's editing that. Mm-hmm. What you want is to have an editor 
who is working on your prose, uh, helping you to improve it, and you need a lot of eyes on it so that a lot of people will read it. And when you write a blog, that doesn't necessarily happen. It's really hard to, to reach, reach. So I would say, just do a whole lot of writing and try to get it published in your school, in your community. Um, so read a lot, write a lot, keep a notebook of phrases that you like and facts that you like and ideas for stories you wanna write. If you wanna be a journalist, you know, you might even want to say, what were the top like 10 nature stories of the year, in my opinion? And you know what? I mean, you're nine. OK, I, I like to point out the fact that young people are not the leaders of tomorrow. They're the leaders of today. And a lot of people are very interested in what a nine year old thinks. So one of the things you could do is contribute a column every once in a while to your local newspaper that all the grownups read. I think people would like to hear that. If, if you don't want to write a column, why not write a letter to the editor and get that published in the paper? So you go. Fantastic advice. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, and I hope that she does, she does continue to pursue that passion. Um, let's see. And then we had a we had a six year old um, who loves your book and wants to ask a couple of questions. He loves animals and wants to be an animal rescuer when he gets older. Oh, great! He said, "How did you stay safe with the piranhas, and how did you know how to bow before the gorilla and not scream when you met the lion and the gorillas?" Oh, great questions! What smart people here? Well, all right, the piranhas. Interestingly, piranhas. <laughs> They have this terrible reputation for like instantly skeletonizing anything that falls in there. <laughs> um, that comes from, um, from a, a true tale that when President Roosevelt visited the Amazon, they wanted to, to show him all kinds of cool stuff. So they kept a whole bunch of piranhas captive and they were starving for a really long time. And then they took like a, a, carcass of a large mammal like a horse and they threw it in with the piranhas and they they ate they ate all the meat well does that mean they're going to eat you no because you're going to meet wild piranhas and i have swum with piranhas repeatedly and i've never ever ever been bitten my friend scott dowd i, I wrote a whole book called amazon adventure that kind of starred scott dowd he's actually swum in um, piranha infested waters when there were piranhas bouncing off his head. They were in a mating frenzy. So these, these fish with their big teeth, they're boing, boing, never bitten. I have had bleeding cuts and never had, they, they just don't, they just don't bite you. It's just kind of not true. Most of the time in most places, wild piranhas will not bother you. Now, how did I know about the gorilla? Well, before I went to meet the gorilla, I had read Diane Fossey's uh, wonderful book, which I highly recommend called Gorillas in the Mist. So I knew how you behave around a gorilla. And I had, uh, before going to Zaire, which is now Congo, I had been to Rwanda and our guides also told us the proper etiquette around gorillas. So when you meet a gorilla, you'll know exactly what to do and the gorillas won't bother you. Oh. I think we have time for just a couple more. Um, what is the best piece of writing advice you received that you still use? Oh boy, I'll tell you. This is something that I, I learned. It's not something someone told me, but the hardest thing that I face and I have now written 30 books. I've done this almost all my adult life. You would think I would not still worry that maybe I can't write the book or I'm not good enough to write the book. But man, I still have that problem sometimes. I still think like, oh man, I'm too much of an idiot. What am I, what am I gonna do? What if I can't finish this? What if I can't do it? What if I'm not worthy? And I'd love to say, oh, and I just tell myself I'm worth it. Well, no, I don't do that. 
can't do that all the time. Sometimes you don't feel like you got it in you, but you can believe in your teachers. So when you're writing and you have writer's block or you're looking at that blank page and it scares the heck out of you and you feel like I can't do this, I can't do this. If you can't believe in yourself, believe in your teachers, believe in the animals and the people that, that you're writing about, believe in the, your story. That's where you can place your confidence and your belief and you'll be able to do it. And then finally, and thank you. And finally, what are your recommendations for what we can do to be better creatures in the world? Oh, wow. Every day we have so many opportunities to be kind, to be kind to other people, to be kind to the environment, to be kind to animals. We get those choices, not just when we're actually interacting with another being, but even when we make choices about what we're going to eat or how we are going to travel. Or if you're gonna take something home in that awful plastic bag that's going to get used for two minutes and will persist in the environment for hundreds of years and will probably choke a whale. Um, so say no to plastic, uh, not just the plastic bags, say no to plastic as much as you possibly can. But every chance you have to, to show kindness and to walk lightly on the earth will make you feel better and will give you um, greater courage and encouragement and make you a stronger person and the better creature that you want to be. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Most people, when they think of the library, they just think of books or librarians that wear glasses and like buns and say shh a lot. But really the library is a much different place from how it was even five years ago. We have amazing collections. We offer movies and CDs and video games. And we also have amazing programming here. For the youngest kids, we have a lot of story times. I think the library has so much to offer. We do a lot of craft programs as well. And then for older kids, we have a book talk club, Snacks in the Stacks, where we give you snacks and you get to talk about whatever you're reading. We've worked with the Special Education Parent Advisory Council to develop a whole collection for parents who have children with special needs. Everybody should know that the library is here for them. Our teen volunteers help us out with running all of our children's programs. They help set up supplies, they help give instruction, they help um, engage with the kids and with parents. We're also really excited to announce that we are getting our mobile library this fall. So we'll be able to bring books to folks who might not be able to come in here and get some books. Chelmsford Public Library is hugely important in this community. That library doesn't belong to the librarians, it belongs to the community. I hope everybody comes to the library because it's a great place to be. Oh no, we've got to go through it!